All right, so we're there in Genesis 41, and uh, just look at the memory verse, chapter, uh, verse 16, Genesis 41, 16. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. So I've taken that as the title this morning, it is not in me. Hey, what Joseph is saying is, hey, my success, what I'm able to accomplish, what I'm able to do, the advice I'm able to give, the interpretation I'm able to, to give to you, Pharaoh, comes from God. So we see a great thing about uh, Joseph, the great character he is. He wants to give all honor and praise unto the Lord, right? He's a humble man. He's not filled with pride. He knows his, his state. He knows he needs the Lord to help him. And so that's one of the key takeouts that we can take from this chapter. Let's start off with verse number one. And it came to pass at the end of two full years. Now, what, what's the two years in reference there? Well, it's been two years since Joseph interpreted the dreams to the butler and to the baker. So what, what do we get out of that? We get, well, let's keep reading, that Pharaoh dreamed and behold, he stood by the river. So what we get out of that from the time that Joseph had, uh, uh, Pharaoh had this dream is that Joseph was in prison for at least two years and beyond that, right? Because he's been there longer than two years. And so you can see, you know, for a man of God, for someone that's been innocent, he has suffered, right? He has gone from some hardships. He has lost a lot of his freedom. And that just gives us the picture that he's at least over two years, even though when we read these stories, it can feel like, you know, it's from one day to the next, one week to the next that we get these stories. But a lot of time passes by as we read these stories. Verse number two, and behold, they came up out of the river, seven well-favored kind, that's cows or cattle, and fat flesh, and they fed in a meadow. So this is the dream of Pharaoh. Verse number three, and behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean flesh, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And so this, this uh, picture that he gets is that, you know, he's got these, these, uh, these cows. And, and the first ones are... Uh, uh, fat flesh, you know, they're, they're, they're healthy cattle, they're healthy cattle, they're fat, they're, they're, they're productive cattle that, that, is, that uh, he finds, he, uh, sorry, dreams of seven of them, but then comes another seven cows, but these are unhealthy, these are malnourished, these are skinny uh, cows, and, uh, and then he wakes up from that dream, right? That's what we read about there, uh, at the brink of the river. Then he has another dream, verse number five, and he slept, so I don't know about that, you know, if you had a dream, you probably experienced that. You've had a dream, and you're like, man, why do I have that dream? And then you're like, well, at least that's over. You go back to sleep, and the dream continues. Or <laughs> you have the same dream all over again. I'm sure you've all experienced that. Well, he has something similar, verse number five. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon the stalk, rank and good. So you have seven ears of corn or, or wheat, you know, the crops that, that, are, that are good, they're, they're, they're um, fruitful, they, they're good. Verse number six, and behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. So then another seven uh, uh, um, uh, what ears of, of uh, corn comes up, but this one's unfruitful. These ones are skinny. They don't look good. They're not good for eating. They spring up after them. Verse number seven, and the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank of full ears and Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. So what happens? These, these uh, sickly looking crops, they eat the healthy ones, right? And that's, he wakes up, you know, and it was a dream. So we have the poorer crop eating up the fruitful crop. And so this, this, bothers, this bo uh, bothers Pharaoh, verse number eight. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Now, keep your finger there. Go back to uh, Genesis, please, um, 40, just the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, just a reminder. So he calls all these powerful men, all the religious leaders, all the wise men, all the guys, hey, can you tell me about my dream? Why have I dreamt this? And how did it end? There, could, uh, there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So just back in the previous chapter, look at verse number 8, just as a reminder, Genesis 40, verse 8, it said at the end of it, And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, I pray you. So why were these magicians and wise men unable to interpret the dream? Because they weren't saved. No, they, they weren't children of God. God was not revealing that to them. They, they, you know, God was not giving these guys the interpretation of the dreams. 
So this lines up with what we saw in the previous chapter, that interpretations can only come, true interpretations, correct interpretations, can only come by God's people or directly by God that, it, that comes. And that's why, you know, whatever we understand in life, our, our opinions, our thoughts, must line up with the Word of God. The Word of God is what helps us understand if we're on the right path or if we're in the wrong path and to bring us back into subjection to what God says. And so, you know, that's important for us. And again, the, the, the truth behind that is that it says, you know, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man, the unsaved man, cannot tell you the things of God. And one thing you'll see as we read through this chapter is these dreams were given to Pharaoh by God, directly by God, and that's why they could not interpret it, because they were not children of God. They were not people of God. And that, this just brings me to my remembrance again, you know, and, and I have these discussions from time to time. You know, I've had someone say to me, you know, when, when, I, when I want to, you know, understand the Bible a little deeper, when I, when I need to understand what's going on in this case, you know, I'll go and, and check out what the rabbis say, what the Jewish rabbis say. Why? Why are you going to go to an unsaved, Christ-denying religious leader to help you understand the Word of God? They're a natural man. They're not born again. They haven't got the Spirit of God. You know, whatever preachers you listen to, you know, you might be, you know, you might be curious. Ah, oh, you know, I really want to understand this portion of Scripture. Or I really want to understand what, what the Bible teaches about this topic. And then, you know, you'll give up searching for the saved man and you just YouTube, you know, the topic and whatever preachers preaching on it, you listen to. No, wrong. All right? You're listening to the wise men or, or the magicians that haven't got the Spirit of God. They're not going to be able to tell you the truth. They're not going to be able to interpret properly what God has to say to you. Okay? Make sure whatever you listen to, whatever preachers, whatever books online, whatever articles you read, whatever it is, whoever you go for some, some counsel and wisdom, you go to a spiritual man, you go to someone that is saved. You're better off just going to the children in this church that are saved, and they'll tell you more truth than the unsaved false prophet. Okay? So what's good about this is the, at least these magicians aren't trying to give a false interpretation. At least they're honest enough to Pharaoh to say, hey, we can't interpret this, right? And uh, so again, you know, be careful who you seek answers to. Make sure it's not the unsaved Jewish rabbi, okay, who's a Christ rejecter. You know, Jesus said, you know, if you believed Moses, you would have believed on him, okay? So they don't even believe Moses. They don't even believe the teachings of the Old Testament. So why would you go to them? For counsel of the Old Testament. But anyway, verse number 9, Genesis 41, verse 9. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh. So that's the butler who had his dream interpreted correctly uh, uh, in the previous chapter, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker, and we dreamed the dream when one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there, and, and there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams, to each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored into, unto mine office, and him he hanged. So what do we learn there? That it took... You know, uh, that it took at least, you know, two years, right? Again, that idea of, of Joseph being at least there for two years since interpreting the dreams. This guy forgot about Joseph completely for two years. And I had preached about this last week, the need, you know, that when you're unappreciated, don't worry, just keep serving the Lord. The Lord knows, and he's going to come through for you. But what happens in verse number 14? So Pharaoh now knows about Joseph. Pharaoh know, now knows that Joseph is able to interpret dreams. Verse number 14 then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Now, you guys thought all the godly men had beards in the Bible, right? <laughs> what do we see? Can we establish a doctrine and say, well, God, you know, wants all men to have beards, and, you know, you shouldn't shave. Now, what do we see? We see a godly man, a good character, right? What's the first thing he does? Oh, you're going to bring me before Pharaoh? He has a quick shave, all right? Now, we know why he has a shave. He also changes his garments. So obviously, he has prison clothing on. You know, I'm sure it's tattered. It's not, you know, presentable. So what he wants to do is make himself, himself presentable. His beard is probably not presentable. His beard's probably not growing in its right place. And he's like, I can't fix this up. So he just shaves it all off, right? Puts on some new clothes and goes before Pharaoh. 
So what do we learn there? We learn that, you know, a, a good godly character, you know, if you're a good character, you should be someone that's presentable, right? When you come behind the pulpit to preach the Word of God, to show people what the Word of God says, you know, if your beard is in tatters, you know, if, if you're, if, you know, shave it off or whatever, right? Tidy up or just make sure if you've got a beard, you keep it nice and trimmed, you keep it nice and tidy. You know, there's a reason why, you know, I want you guys to put on a tie. I want you to be presentable when you come to the house of God. We see that in, in, as a good character in Joseph. We should be doing the same thing. And you say, well, he did it because, you know, Pharaoh is very important, very powerful. Listen, I don't care about that. The children of God in this church are more important than Pharaoh. So if it's good enough to be presentable to Pharaoh, how much more then is it necessary to be presentable before the children of God, right? Verse number 15. And Pharaoh uh, said unto Joseph, I have dreamed the dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I, have, uh, and I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. That's awesome, right? And th- again, you know, the, 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 I, I've said to you that these chapters, you know, chapters 39, 40, 41, have a lot of great things for leaders, especially preachers, people that want to be pastors or deacons. You know, learn from Joseph. He's such a great man, such great character, a guy who goes from nothing to taking on positions of authority. And he's always able to praise God. He's always able to thank God for, you know, what he's able to achieve. You know, and, you know, sometimes I get the compliments, hey, that's a great sermon. Well, praise God. It actually makes me feel better, right? Because I know that the study, the hard work I'm given has been helpful to some of you. But at the same time, we can't forget to thank God. You know, we can't allow those things to go to, the, to your heads because the only reason we can interpret, right? The only reason we can understand the Word of God is because of the Spirit of God that is in us, right? As saved people. And so, um, you know, the Bible says in Philippians 3, 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Of course, that's about salvation. We don't have any confidence that our flesh, that our works will save us. But it it should also be true in our spiritual walk, that the things we achieve, the good works we do, right? You know, seeing so saved is not because of you. It's not because of your flesh, right? You give God the glory. It's God who's equipped you with the ability to preach the gospel. It's God who's given you His Word, which is what brings faith, right? To see someone call upon the name of the Lord without the Lord, you wouldn't be able to do it, okay? And so we ought to be the same kind of people with no confidence, confidence in the flesh. And then uh, also, um, what I also like about Joseph here is that he's not ashamed to acknowledge God, right? He's not ashamed to, to give thanks to God amongst the people who do not know the God of Israel, right? And this just reminds me of Matthew 10, 32. I'll just read it to you. You know, Jesus says these words, Whosoever shall, uh, therefore shall confess me, before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So if you want Christ to, to speak highly of you before God the Father, you know, when you're saved and you go to heaven and he says, oh, you know, brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so there, you know, and, and he speaks highly of you, it's because you took the time to speak highly of God. You were not ashamed of his name, not ashamed of the God that you worship, and you, you know, you were, you were public about what you believe. You were public about the God that you worshiped. You know, the benefit there is that God will do the same for you. Jesus Christ will do the same be- to you before God the Father. And, uh, you know, keep that in mind, you know, don't be ashamed. And you see, Joseph, he's not ashamed. You know, I have no doubt when we all get to heaven that, you know, Jesus will say, well, this is Joseph, right? You know, he gave glory to God even in his hardships. He gave glory to God even in a nation which had rejected, obviously, or did not know the God of the Bible. Anyway, verse number 17 there. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat flesh and well favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. And, uh, and now this is a little bit of extra information that we did not read earlier, but it says in verse number 20, And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the, the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, 
but they were still ill-favored as at, at the beginning, so I awoke. So we get a little bit more information there. Not only did these seven cows, these, these uh, malnourished, sickly-looking cows come up after the, the ones that were uh, fat and healthy, but they ate the fat ones, right? They, they, they ate of them, and even though it, these cows ate these very healthy cows, according to this extra information, they remained looking lean, all right? Now, if you ate a big cow, you'd put on weight, right? If you were, you were eating well, you'd be putting weight, you'd be looking healthy. But the story here is that, no, these, these uh, ill, malnourished cows still looked the same way. And this caused him to awake. So this is like, uh, this, is bo- this is bothering him. This is like a nightmare. This is a, like a nightmare to Pharaoh. And verse number 22, it says, And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered, thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them, and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God have showed Pharaoh what he is able about to do. Okay, so the dream of Pharaoh is one. Now this will, if you guys can just keep this in mind, this phrase, uh, the dream of Pharaoh is one for the afternoon service, all right? Uh, but just one thing that you'll notice there, how many dreams did Pharaoh have? Did he have one dream or two? He had two, okay? But he says, of the two, they were one, okay? So those dreams are united. They, 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 they come hand in hand. They're together. In the same way where we would say that, you know, um, you know, two, they get married, husband and wife, they become one flesh, okay? And this is important, not so much for now, but for the, for the next sermon, and so what he's saying is, you know, the message that's coming from the dreams are one and the same. Okay, so there's unity in the dreams. Verse number 26, the seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. So there's that phrase again, the dream is one, even though there were two dreams. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is a thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. So what, what's, the, what's the interpretation there, right? That there's going to be seven great years, right, of crops growing, of fruitfulness, but then there's going to be seven years of famine straight after that. So these dreams are a future presentation of the next 14 years that are going to take place. Verse number 29, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty, throughout all the land of Egypt. I just want you to notice that it's not like the next seven years are normal years of fruitfulness, but they're years of great plenty, you know, above the norm, okay? So you're going to be able to get much more in the next seven years than you would normally get in your standard years. Verse number 30, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. So the teaching there is, you know, when these when these malnourished cows were eating the healthy cows, or when the, the, the thin wheat were, you know, devouring the fat wheat. You know, what he's saying is, you know, once you're going through the famine, like you're going to enjoy the first seven years, it's going to be wonderful, but once you, once you experience the famine, then you're going to totally forget how good the first seven years were. That's how bad the next seven years are going to be, is what he's saying, right? You're not even going to be able to rejoice and be thankful for the previous seven years. Verse 31, and the plenty... Uh, shall not be known, did I read that already? Anyway, known by the land, by reason of the famine following, for it shall be very grievous, very grievous, okay? So we, we see the interpretation of the dream there. Now, it's important for us to just keep in mind that the next seven years are going to be very plenteous, okay? It's not your standard years. It's not, you know, if a farmer went out and, and did his standard work and was expecting a certain growth, well, this would be a lot more, okay? The land would be extremely fruitful. Verse number 32, Verse number 32, and for that, the dream was doubled in Pharaoh twice. Okay, this is important, right? So Pharaoh has this dream twice. It's a double dream. It says, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. So are there any doubts that these dreams were not of God or of God? They were of God, right? God gave him two dreams, and we get a very, very important principle here. What is that? that it was established because there were two dreams, right? This is a very important biblical principle, um, and I'll just quickly read to you from 2 Corinthians 13.1. It says, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. God gave Pharaoh two dreams to establish this dream. 
two witnesses of the same event that's going to play out. So what's the principle there? That whatever you believe in the Bible, okay, whatever doctrines you build, that you've got more than one verse. Okay, and I'd say more than one clear verse. More than one verse is just black and white. And you see this happen all over again, right? You take people that, you know, see people with false doctrine. Number one, they'll take a verse that doesn't plainly state what they believe. Or they have one verse that may point to what they're saying, but they've just got the one verse, you know? And uh, so this is, a, this is an important truth of the Bible. You know, don't rest on one verse. If you're trying to establish something, get more than, you know, two, get two or three verses teaching the same thing. That's how you establish yourself. That's how you, you know, build stability in your knowledge and your wisdom of the Word of God. You know, and as, as preachers, you get behind the pulpit, you know, don't preach something that's vague or unknown. If you've got something with two or three witnesses, great. You know, you know preach it with all authority because it comes from God, right? And so that's a great lesson that we see in the Bible. But not only is this a principle in the things that we ought to know of what God says, but this is also true of the nature of God, right? Also true of the nature of God. And uh, 1 John 5, 6 says, This is He, speaking of Jesus, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. And then we have the famous verse, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Listen, the doctrine of the Trinity is important. It's foundational, because according to God's Word, if something needs to be established, it needs to come from at least two or three witnesses. Now, if God was just one person, if we just took that view... Well, Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. We've only got one witness of Himself. Well, then we can't trust that God. All right? It's not the true God. How can I know the oneness God is telling me any truth when there's only one witness? It's not good enough. Okay? We see how God does things. You know, God in His own nature is free. And by being free, the Father says the same thing the Son says. The same thing the Holy Spirit confirms for us, which Christ has taught. This gives us the two, three witnesses we need to know that the, the God that we worship is the one true God. That the Bible that we read is coming from that one true God and we can establish ourselves. We know this is grounded in truth, you know, and that gives us the confidence. You know, God is three persons. You know, that's a God that's worthy of worship. That's a God that we know speaks the truth, okay? And uh, the one is God. Not only does it not exist, but it's a God that I would never trust. Okay, I don't know how people can believe that when, you know, he can't even witness, you know, give more than one record or one witness of who he is. Anyway, verse number 33, Genesis 41, verse 33. So Joseph continues speaking, right? He's told Pharaoh the uh, interpretation of the dream. He tells him about the problem. And this is another great characteristic of a good leader, a good character. Not only does he identify the problem, but now what does he, he He's done the job, right? That's what he was called to do. Give me the interpretation of the dream. So he gives the interpretation. He's done his job, or has he? Now, some people, you know, if you're lazy or a bad character, you do your job, and that's it, and you walk out of there. You know, they ask me for the interpretation. I've given it. That's their problem. What do we see in Joseph, though? What kind of character do we see? He keeps talking. He goes, now, therefore, he's starting to give Pharaoh advice, right? He says, now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Hey, that's good leadership. That's good character. Oh, identify the problem, so I'm going to offer a solution. That's what you do, right? That's how you get promoted. That's how people look up to you, right? Anybody can find problems. Listen, if you just wanted to find problems of New Life Baptist Church, join the club. We can all do it. But how many of you will have the character to say, well, this is a problem, let me offer a solution? That's what I'm looking for when it comes to people. You know, when I was a, when I was a manager and I was promoting people, when I take on supervisors, I was always looking for the person that could, yes, identify a problem, but would then step in and say, but this is what we can do. That's the kind of person you want, right? You know, Pharaoh doesn't want to have to fix every problem in Egypt. That's why he's got the wise men. That's why he has the magicians, even though they're worthless, right? This is why he now promotes 
Joseph is because he's looking for the men with solutions, okay? And if you want to be a leader, you want to be that kind of person of good character, you've got to develop this, right? You know, if you've got a job and all you do is winch the manager, oh, this is rubbish, this is nonsense, this is dumb, you know, he's not going to like you. And you're going to think you're valuable because I can point out all the problems. Anybody can point out the problems. Anybody, right? The, the wise one will either shut up because he, he thinks, well, I don't have a solution. I don't know how we're going to fix this, right? Or he's willing to work it out. And here's the thing. The people that dwell on problems a lot, they ought to be the ones with a solution. Because you've had the time to think about this problem. This is bother, bothersome, you know, and, and therefore... You know, the reason you know it's a problem is because you know that it can be better. You know that there's a solution that can be appoint, ap- applied. But then the right person says, I'll do it. Right? I'll take on the problem. I'll fix this up, even though that's not what I was called to do. He was called to interpret. Right? He goes above and beyond. He does more than what was required of him. And, uh, you know, this, this is something, you know, and again, you know, I'm just, I'm just giving you my, my experience in the workplace. This is the difference between meetings business meetings that are a waste of time, and business meetings that are effective, okay? And, you know, I, like I said, I always wanted the person, the person would come to my office, this is a problem. I'd be like, so what's the solution? It's like, oh, I don't know. All right, can you go come back into the office when you found a solution? Eventually, they figured out, I better not go to him until I have a solution, right? This is a problem, and this is what I'm willing to do. Okay, oh, so oh, this is the solution. My next thing will be, all right, it's yours, okay? You worked it out, go and sort it out. And then like, oh, man, I better not come up with a solution unless I'm willing to actually be the one that carries out the solution, right? But that makes things effective, right? And here's the thing. In due time, people work out what I'm, what I'm willing to do, you know, the kind of boundaries that I set, right? And then they don't have to come into the office to tell me about the problem and the solution. They just see the problem and they just fix it, right? You know, I'm sure Pharaoh didn't need to know every problem in Egypt, right? He had other people there to see the problem and to fix it. And this is where, you know, you get effective meetings, right? If you're someone that is in meetings and you're, you're, you're bored half to death, well, meetings are very effective, okay, as long as you do them right. And this is what I found. A lot of meetings, you know, business meetings, maybe even church meetings, people are just throwing a problem. You know, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. But no one's saying, well, I'll take care of it, okay? That's a waste of time. There's no, there's nothing going forward. These are the meetings that I liked. At the end of the month, all right, how was the month of May? This is what we did. These are the numbers. This is the productivity. We had these problems, but we sorted them out like this. That's cool. These are other issues we're dealing with. This is how we're currently dealing with it. That's a productive meeting, right? That's a productive meeting. Oh, good, right? You can see the work that people are doing. They're stepping up to the plate and taking care of it. That's Joseph. That's a leader, okay? Making sure they step in and deal with it. Now, what verse am I up to here, guys? Uh, Verse number 34, verse number 34. Let Pharaoh do this, Joseph's still speaking, and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So he goes like, let's raise the taxes, basically, to 20%, okay? A fifth part. Now, I've heard someone someone mentioned to me that, you know, this is where, you know, Joseph may have, you know, because I said to him, there's nothing really recorded of wrong things that he did. Well, this might be a record of him doing something wrong, where he increased taxes, right? But, of course, look, we don't, you know, the Bible doesn't give us the detail of how all of this played out, okay? We know there are going to be extremely plenteous years to come. We know the character of Joseph. I don't believe for a second that Joseph went from, you know, taking taxes to 5% to 20%. I don't believe that for a second, you know? What I know, I know the kind of character Joseph is, right? He not, look, let's say, let's say you run a business. For those of you that run your own business, I'm sure this is common sense to you. If God guarantees to you the next seven years, you know, there's going to be so much work. You know, like so much work, it's going to be plenty. You won't even be able to keep up with it. What are you going to do? If you, you've got that confirmation from God, are you just going to continue business as is? No, you're going to hire more staff right? You're going to take on, you're going to get more tools or whatever it is. You're going to prepare yourself for the seven plenteous years so you can accomplish the work that's necessary, right? So you can be more productive, right? Now, I I can't tell you because I I don't have a clear scripture here. We don't have the detail of what Joseph did, but that would be common sense. We know the character that Joseph is, right? I have no doubt 
that he went to the farmers, the people of this land, and say, hey, guys, get ready. Don't, don't just sow what you normally sow. Sow more than you normally do. I'll even send you helpers. We'll get some farm hands on hand. We'll get some extra people. We'll get more people that can collect. And the nation will profit. All of the nation will profit. And we'll be able to take 20%, oh, sorry, uh, 5%, no, 20% of the produce, right? But here's the thing. Not only does Egypt profit, but so does the farmer, right? He's not with less. He's got more. He's been guaranteed the next seven years. He's got extra hands. He's got extra workers. You know, it's more, there's more productivity. Yeah, even the landowners, I'm sure, for the character that Joseph is, is making a profit from this, okay? It would be similar to someone who runs a business, and, you know, let's say you're running a business and you're only making $50,000, right? So you hire a business um, count, like a, what do they call them? People that, like, help businesses. Um, anyway, whatever, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Someone that has knowledge of business. That person comes in, he says, well, it's going to cost you this much for my service, but then by the end of it, instead of making $50,000, you'll be making $100,000, right? That would be the same thing. So someone comes alongside and helps you produce more. They get something out of it. Egypt gets something out of it, but so would the people that are the farmers and the landowners and, and the workers, you know? They would also be prospering from these years. You couldn't just do it with the current resources you had. These years are above and beyond the norm, all right? So, I, again, I have no doubt that that's the kind of person that Joseph was. And verse number 35, And let them gather all the food of those good years to come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and the land, per- sorry, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants, all right? So we see Joseph is very wise, giving counsel, not just a problem, but offering a solution. And Pharaoh says, yeah, this is awesome. This is what we need to do. Verse number 38, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such an one as this, a man whom the Spirit of God is? So what does he recognize? He says, man, you've got God's spirit. You know, yeah, God can interpret. God is using you. Verse number 39, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God have showed this, or, uh, showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. What an amazing promotion, right? From being in the jail to now being second in command, basically being Pharaoh in a sense, but de facto Pharaoh, except for the throne, right? Able to control everything, all the commerce, all the business in the land of Egypt. And, you know, Joseph becomes a, a rich man, you know? So what, what do we learn here? That, you know, to excel in your, you know, to excel in your job, you know, to land job opportunities, learning God's word, you know, applying the things that you learn in God's word, you know, needs to be applied in all aspects of your life. You know, it profits you everywhere. You know, you know, learning the Bible shouldn't just be something you think, well, this is just, you know, for church, or this is just, you know, the times that I'm with the Lord. You know, this is just, you know, when I'm out soul winning. No, the truth of God's Word, the wisdom that comes from God's Word, you've got to take that and apply it everywhere, even in your workplace. You apply God's words, right? You apply the instruction, the guidance you see in your workplace the guarantee is you'll be more productive. The guarantee is you'll get those opportunities open up to you, okay? Because it works anywhere. And people will see, they may not even know you're a believer, right? But people will see there's something about this person. It's the Spirit of God, all right? It's the knowledge that God gives. So we, let's give them more. Let's give them more opportunities. Let's give them the promotions. You know, let's give them opportunities to, to take on, you know, jobs because we see the wisdom he has, right? The wisdom that comes from God by being a problem solver, resolving issues. It works in all aspects of your life. Verse number 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it unto Joseph's hand. Now, this is obviously a picture. You know, the the ring kind of represents like, like his authority, right? So saying, look, I'm giving you the same authority that I have, right? Even the ring might even represent like the riches, right? The riches of Pharaoh. He goes, Joseph, they're in your hands. That's, that's, what, that's the picture that's going on here. And arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And uh, he made him to ride in the second chariot 
which he had. So what do we learn here, right? He gets this promotion, he gets his job, and he gets rich, right? He gets the riches of Pharaoh, he gets some new clothes, he gets a new car, right? He gets a second, the chariot, and, and they cried before him, you know, bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And this is why I'm saying, you know, riches in of themselves are not sinful, right? If you know a believer that's excessively wealthy, that's rich, you know, you can't think, well, this guy's just after the money. You know, do you think Joseph was after money? No, he was just after doing what's right, right? You know, doing what God has asked him to do, and God was able to bless him with the riches, right? And so there's nothing wrong, you know, I get people that have a nice car sometimes say to me, should I have that car, you know, do you think it's right? Well, if God's given it to you, if you got the riches and you had to afford it, you know, now, you know, you know, learn not to cover it, you know, be satisfied with what you have. You know, praise God, you've got this nice car. Well, praise God, you know, enjoy. You don't have to, you know, worry yourself silly about whether I should have that or not. If God has given it to you, praise God, you know, praise God. He blesses us even with riches uh, sometimes in this life. And uh, so what I do want to mention here, if I can keep, um, oh, sorry, I'll just read the next verse, number 44. Verse number 44, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. So what do we what do we learn here, right? Joseph is given a position of authority, right? And with his authority comes wealth, right? But what else comes with that? If someone's taken on great authority or leadership, there also comes great risk, all right? Great risk. So we already know that Pharaoh... If he's mad enough, he's going to hang you, right? He'll put you to death. Could you imagine if Joseph messed up now? Like he just said, hey, this is what's going to happen. Pharaoh throws everything at him to make it work. And then Joseph fails in his job. He'll lose his life. Guaranteed, right? And so what I'm trying to say is, you know, when you take on positions of authority, of leadership, you've got to understand you're also taking on risk. This is why it's so important that you're, you know, serving with God. You're you're doing things in accordance to uh, God's word. And, uh, you know, this is why I'm against you know, communism. And this is why I'm against workers' unions, right? Because the, the, the philosophy behind these, these uh, ideas is that, you know, everyone should be paid equally, right? If you're a business owner or you're the worker, you know, those profits should be shared equally across the board. Or whether you're a lazy worker or whether you're a productive, this is why I've never joined unions, brethren. I didn't, you know, they, oh, we're fighting for your pay increase. I don't want your stupid pay increase. What, the 1%, the 2% you get for everybody? I'd rather stand out and get the 10%. All right, I'd rather stand out and get the 20%. All right? Otherwise, if I'm just going to go with your 1% or 2%, yeah, I'll be lazy as well. If that's what, you know, what's the point of working hard then? You know? And these, these stupid philosophies that we have today, you know, communism, that no, you know, if you're running a risk, you deserve to pay yourself more. Right? If you're a business owner, maybe you have to take out a loan to run your business or whatever, you know, you ought to pay yourself more than the apprentice you hire, right? He's got no risk, right? He just comes in, you know, so, you know, we see these, these principles in the Bible and this works, this makes sense, right? The more risk you take, you know, the more you should be honored, the more you should be, you know, paid, right? And, you know, I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor, but the Bible speaks of pastors being worthy of double honor, those that rule, you know, the, the, uh, you know, God's house will. Why? Because he's got greater risk. There's a greater condemnation when a pastor messes up than the average person in the church, right? These are just things that apply in, in all aspects uh, of life. Anyway, let's keep reading verse number 45. There's a lot of great topics in this, this chapter that you could just take, you know, make entire sermons out of. But let's just touch upon these truths. Verse number 45, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zapnath uh, Paneah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Keep your finger there and go back to Genesis 37 now. Genesis 37, verse 2. So how old was Joseph when he spoke to Pharaoh and was promoted? 30 years old, right? 30 years old. Genesis 37, verse 2. And uh, this was the introduction that we had of Joseph. It says here, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, etc. So when we're introduced to Joseph, he's 17 years old, right? When he's the favored son, he's 17 years old. When he, you know, I'm not sure how much time took place from the time then he got sold 
as a slave, but he was a young man, all right? So what we learned there is that 13 years have passed since being his father's favorite son. 13 years, right? Being sold as a slave, you know, serving in Potiphar's house, being put in prison, and now ultimately being second in command of an entire nation. It took, you know, 13 years, 13 hard years, very hard years for Joseph, losing his family, losing everything he knows, you know, being falsely accused, being put in prison, and another great characteristic we see of a great leader there, right? His perseverance. He didn't give up, right? He just kept serving the Lord no matter what situation it took. And it took 13 years to finally, you know, reap what he sold. 13 years. You know, some of us aren't willing to even risk one month, right? You know, put in one month in and then we, we give up when we, we don't see results, right? You get on that keto diet. You've done it for two months. Oh, man, I look the same. You give up. You can do it for 13 years. Or you do it until it's answered, right? Now, I'm just using that as a stupid example. But, you know, other things in life, other goals you're trying to achieve, don't give up, right? Even when it looks like you're going backwards. Joseph went backwards, right? Being thrown in prison, being put, a, you know, made a slave, all these kinds of things. He goes backwards, but in God's calendar, he was going forwards, right? You know, Joseph was, cre- um, was um, getting good characteristics, was learning great truths of God and serving the Lord even when things were difficult. Please continue serving the Lord even when it's difficult. Keep asking the Lord your prayer requests, the things that are on your heart. Don't give up. Keep, keep asking the Lord for the things that you need. And then it says here in verse number 47, Genesis 41, verse 47. 47. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. Ah, uh, yeah, by handfuls. So you can see above and beyond. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. So what a blessing of God, right? What great fruitfulness. You know, he was keeping records. He was counting everything they had. And he's like, you know what? Forget counting. We just got too much, right? And what what a great privilege. You know, God was faithful to his word. You know, did not let Joseph down. Verse number 50. And unto Joseph was born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bear unto him, <clears throat> unto him. Now, notice the names that he gives his children here. These are, these gives us a, a sort of an insight of Joseph and how he was sort of uh, coping with the changes in his life. And it says here in verse number 51, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. What a great thing about Joseph, right? So what he's saying, did he have uh, you know, did he suffer when he was sold as a slave? Absolutely, he suffered greatly, right? But he calls his first son Manasseh, and, and he names him this because what it means is that the Lord made him forget all his toil. No, the Lord made him forget all his difficulties, all the past, you know, issues. Instead of being sorrowful, instead of being depressed, instead of being cast down, the Lord was able to get him through, right? And it says here, he, for, you know, he forgot. It's not like God wiped his memory. Of course, he knows where he came from. Okay, of course, he's thinking of his father and his brethren, but he's no longer sorrowful, right? He's, he's, he's thankful for the position he's at, right? He's serving the Lord no matter what difficulties he's facing. He's being fruitful. He's having great fellowship with God. And by being a Christian like that, that's, that's communion, you know, uh, or communicating with the Lord, you're going to be able to forget your past mistakes, right? I'm sure many of you have made mistakes in the past. You regret. You have two options. You either keep revisiting those past sins, keep putting yourself down, being full of sorrow, or you say, well, Lord, this is where I'm at today. Please help me to live out my life in accordance to your will. That's going to help you forget the things of the past, right? The things you can't change, the things in the past you can't change, put them behind you. And that's what he calls his son. And, uh, you know, this famous verse, Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before So even Paul says, this is something I have to do. This is something that I've done is to forget my past, the mistakes, the persecution, all the grief, all the regrets that I have. You know, now I'm just going to serve the Lord. I'm going to think about the future. And so that's the characteristic of great men, of great ladies, great, uh, you know, leaders that we see in the Bible. And then look at verse number 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God had caused me to be fruitful 
in the land of my affliction, right? So he says, look, this is a land, I don't really like it, <laughs> like, it brings me affliction, right? But he says, but even in the face of tribulation, trials and difficulties, the Lord has made me fruitful. Praise God. You know, because right now, you might be going through difficulty. I don't know. I don't know your situation. You know, we share things with one another, prayer requests, things like that. But I'm sure there are other things you struggle with that you don't want to be open in public. You know, difficulties that you're going through, you know, the Lord can make you fruitful, even in those difficulties, right? Again, don't give up on God. God is faithful to you. You keep being faithful to Him. Whatever challenges you're going through, just be faithful to God, and God will make you fruitful. You know, great, you know, um, uh, spiritual maturity, you know, about, you know, great character in Joseph. He doesn't give up, you know. And, and a Christian that gives up in trials and difficulties and says, you know, he just gives up on the Lord, gives up on church, gives up on those things. The reason they do that is just because, you know, they're carnal Christians. They're babes in Christ. They've not grown in maturity, right? If you're someone that can, can, can get through challenges and difficulties, you're demonstrating your spiritual maturity uh, to, to others. Verse number 53. And the seven years of plenteous that were, was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth or famine began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. Why was there bread? Because of Joseph's hard work, keeping you know, the wheat, saving it up for the hard years to come. Verse number 55, And when all the land of Egypt were famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because the famine was so sore in all the lands. So there's one final thought that I want to take out of the rest of this chapter here. It's uh, specifically, specifically there in verse number 55, right? And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, right? They, they ran out of food. They go to Pharaoh and say, look, can you give us bread? And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. You know, my final thought there, I want to take this as a spiritual lesson here, you know? Learning the Bible, coming to church, hearing preaching, applying the things in your life, memorizing scriptures, living your life in accordance to God's word, right? Reading your Bible cover to cover, you know, again and again and again is never a waste of time. Never a waste of time, right? Because what we learn here is there will come times when there's a famine, a famine for the word of God, a dearth in the land, and people are going to be looking for the one that can give them bread, right? They're going to be looking for the people that know the truth of God's word, right? Keep studying, Keep learning the Bible, all right? I'm sure, look, you're going to find, situ- and I'll give you one story here. You're going to find situations that there are going to be family, friends, right? That, right, my, that my, uh, right now, they probably think they have enough. They probably think they don't need you. They probably don't think they need the Lord, right? There's going to come in a time in their life when they're hungry, when, when they're going through famine, and they're like, who's got the bread, right? Who's got the truth of God's word? Don't be surprised when they come to you and ask you once again, Right? You've tried. They, they said, I'm not interested. They come to you, can you tell me once again about the gospel? Can you tell me once again why you believe what you believe? Can you tell me once again the church you attend? You know, we may never see on the national level, right? We may never see our nation of Australia, our politicians and the people in charge say, we need God. We need the word of God, right? Where are God's preachers? Where are those that again preach the Bible? You know, without compromise. We may never see that as a nation, as a whole. But one thing you'll definitely see are individuals, individuals that God has put in your life, right, where they're going to go through hardship. They're going to go through, you know, looking for answers, looking for the truth. And, you know, I just, just reminded just when I was down in Sydney, you know, one of the brothers down there uh, went to visit a family down in Melbourne. And they've got an elderly, well, it's his grandmother-in-law, so his wife's grandmother. And she's been, you know, Catholic, you know, Catholic, Catholic born, Catholic bred, and they expected her to be Catholic dead right? And, you know, all her relatives are Catholic, right? And she's 80-something years old, right? And I think she's sort of close to death or some, something, something that, you know, has made her now think about death, right? And uh, she did not, look, she, she didn't want to hear from her children and the relatives that are Catholic. She knew they're not right, you know, and she started to look for the truth. Who's got the truth? 
And, you know, the brother down in Sydney, she, she called for him and said, look, can you tell me what you believe? Can you tell me, you know, why is it that you're no longer Catholic? And that opened the doors for them to give. And 80, you know, most of us, when we knock doors on an 80-year-old, we kind of like, oh, no, you know, right? They, <laughs> right, because they've gone their whole life rejecting God. You know, many, many of them are reprobate, right? They, they've, you know, but you don't know, right? And she called for the truth. She needed the bread. She asked for the truth. She got saved. Now, praise God. You know, these things happen in real life. And so, you know, please, you know, don't give up on the people you know. You know, you don't have to, you know, destroy every friendship, every family situation. You know, they might not be hungry right now for the Word of God. You know, but if you destroy those relationships, you know, when they're looking for it, they may not come to you because of the destroyed relationship. Try to keep those things open as much as possible, all right? As much as without, you know, comp- you compromising on the Word of God. Try to keep those channels open because you don't know what opportunities God may present to you with it when people are looking for the truth of God's Word. So, you know, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks if you are a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Joseph was ready. Joseph was ready for the seven hard years, right? And he had an answer. And so we ought to have answers as well for those that come looking for bread. All right, let's pray.